Hello and welcome to Science Minds, presented by the Autism Research Training Program at the UC Davis Mind Institute in conjunction with the Distinguished Lecture Series. Science Minds is a platform to tell the stories of scientists, researchers, and thinkers in the field of neurodevelopmental disabilities. In this podcast, we aim to go beyond the science and delve into experiences that have led people to the field and have helped shape their thinking and perspectives toward inquiry and science. I am your host, Andy Dacopoulos, and we're very honored to have uh, Steve Nocter with us here today. Thanks, it's a pleasure to be here. Dr. Nocter is an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at UC Davis Medical School and is a faculty member at the Mind Institute. He received his PhD from the Uniformed Services University in Maryland. Dr. Nocter studies perinatal development of the cerebral cortex and how the cerebral cortex develops during early stages of life. A central focus of his work investigates factors that control the embryonic stem and progenitor cells that produce cortical neurons and glial cells. His current work examines how interactions between the developing nervous, immune, and vascular system govern growth of the brain during prenatal development. Dr. Nocter's work has helped open new avenues news for understanding the etiology of neurodevelopmental disabilities that result from alterations in brain cell production. You know, I had a chance to kind of scour the internet a little bit and get some more kind of bio information from you, um, looking into kind of what you do and um, what you're all about. And, you know, I think back to my time as like a kid and even going through graduate school. And to me, you kind of embody sort of the ultimate scientist, right? Like, you're in the lab, you've got your white coat, you're like doing these amazing experiments. Um, you know, I looked into your, you know, your PhD work was using ferret animal models, mm -hmm. um, looking at cortical development in, in these animal models. And so to me, it's your, um, you really sort of embody like what science is in, in kind of my early stages mind thinking about it. Um, and I'm kind of interested to know, like, what was your trajectory, you know, from a young age, maybe getting to that point of, like, knowing what you wanted to do in your career or the direction you were headed? Mm -hmm. um, what was that trajectory like for you and what led you to, to, to where you are today? My trajectory was not um, typical, not a, you know, direct line, point A to point B. I had a lot of interest and in a lot of things that I considered that I might want to do. Um, I remember in high school thinking that perhaps I was interested in architecture. Um, and then when I started college, I was interested in psychology and I was taking a lot of social psychology classes and still not thinking of science really, but um, thinking of psychology in a clinical, um, in a clinical aspect. And so I was taking courses and doing training along that line of thought. And pretty late, like not until my junior year in college, I, um, I had a class that for the first time mentioned the word neurotransmitter, which, you know, I think that wouldn't be the case today, but back then, you know, they were pretty divergent. Um, you know, that like social psychology and neuroscience. Neuroscience as a field really was still growing and I, I don't think I'd ever heard the word. So um, the trajectory was, you know, thinking I'm kind of interested in math, maybe I'm interested in um, architecture and something combining arts and math and then becoming interested in psychology. And then I had one class with Charles Flaherty on conditioning and learning. He was the first person I ever heard utter the word neurotransmitter and he talked about brain cells. And, and that was really like a, a focal point that really, um, put things in perspective for me, his one class. And in particular, during one of his lectures, he mentioned that he would take undergraduates like myself and let us work in his lab. And I was like, wow, that's cool. I wanna learn what that's about. So I, as soon as class was over, I marched up and said, can I work in your lab? <laughs> he said, well, come, come and talk. Anyway, I ended up working in his lab for the last two years of, of my undergraduate. And, and he's, he's an amazing guy. He was an amazing guy, he passed away. Um, but that was like a seminal point in um, my understanding that I had an interest in science and that this was a field and that this is a career that, that I could pursue. And so he was an early model in what a scientist for me represented. 
Um, he was a super interesting guy. He would, you know, we'd all be in the lab and he'd come in every morning around nine and he would talk for 30 minutes about what he was thinking about while he was driving in. And he always had funny stories that kind of just put everything together, you know, current events, his previous experience and what's going on in the lab today. And it was just a blast. Um, so Charles Flaherty really put me on the path that brings me to this chair discussing yeah. with you today. That was, that was sort of my trajectory, a long, long answer short. Okay. One thing that you said that, I, that kind of piqued my ear was um, when you talked about sort of the intersection between like art and math mm -hmm. and uh, science. Mm -hmm. And that's something in your work that I think, you know, you take these gorgeous photos of you know, neurons and what inner workings of the brain. And I'm kind of interested to just kind of hear how you see maybe those relationships um, kind of playing out right now. I guess I was always interested in art. And so I took a number of art classes in high school and I never really considered myself any good at it. <laughs> you know, I, I liked sketching and drawing, um, but enjoyed it more. and. Over, it took many years for, for me to realize that, you know, I'm just a visually based person. And I really, you know, um, I became interested in anatomy because it's, you know, the study of visual structures, things that you can see by eye. And then from there, kind of springboarding into microscopic anatomy. Mm -hmm. um, so the intersection between art and science, uh, I, I had an interest in art as a child growing up and would sketch things, you know, horrible drawings. <laughs> But I enjoyed it, and then um, that's what made me think that perhaps architecture could be something because I kind of enjoyed math, and I thought application of math and art um, and mechanical drawing. So I guess I left that out. I, I enjoyed mechanical drawing because there you were really, uh, you weren't freestyling like an art trying to sketch a person's head, but you had these straight lines and angles and things that you had to deal with. Um, and but that that interest in art really drew me to where I am today. Um, when I started graduate school, I had options of of labs that I could work with, and um, I was kind of leaning towards genetic studies. And I started in that direction, but I really missed the visual aspect of it. And I ended up, you know, changing directions and going into a lab that had a confocal microscope where we could take pictures of the brain and then just sit there and look at images of brain cells all day long, which, you know, I'm like a pig in mud doing that. I, I really enjoyed that. That's really cool. Would you say that that was kind of a primary driver of that switch? Yeah, I didn't realize it at the time, but, you know, I, I came to understand it um, over time that, you know, I, the genetic studies were interesting to me, but this really, you know, grabbed my interest and I could sit there at a microscope all day long and, and you know, not realize eight hours had passed by. <laughs> yeah. um, whereas that would not be the case, the scrolling through tables of data coming right. out of, right. uh, you know, um, important stuff just, you know, doesn't grab my attention as much. Well, you know, you talked about, um, you know, that early, the early mentorship in undergrad mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you've, I've, I've seen some blog posts and some things that you've written about some of your mentors in the past, um, like your, doc, your, your doctoral mentors and some of the, your lab mates. And I'm, I'm interested to hear from you what, how you see sort of their role of mentorship yeah. um, in your career and um, sort of how that looks for you. When I ended up in my thesis laboratory with Sharon Giuliano, um, she was a fantastic mentor. She um, showed through example how to lead a lab and we just had a great group working in her lab it was really really an enjoyable time um, so i learned by example um, by her example um, ways that you can try to lead a laboratory group and also you know her keen interest in science overlapped um, a lot with mine and i really learned a lot from her and um, have remained close with her to this day. Um, whenever something really important is on my mind, she's like the first person I call just to, to shoot the breeze, catch up on what's going on. And by the way, what do you think about this? And she always has time. So she, she's um, a great example of what I view as um, really good mentorship. Yeah. And so trying to meet that example is not easy, but mm -hmm. it's something to strive for. For sure. What, what are some of the things that you remember maybe from 
her lab that you try to use with your own you know, lab uh, personnel or students. You're gathering lots of data and you, know, you have ideas for where you're heading, but pictures emerge you know, and hypotheses emerge from the data and, and follow them. So that might be uh -huh. what I kind of picked up from her. Definitely. That's really great. I don't know if she would agree. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mentorship is obviously very important in sort of coming up and, and um, developing into sort of your own scientist and your own person. And I'm interested now in sort of, you know, once you're in the position that you're in, what do, what do collaborations look like? And what do you see as the importance of collaboration Mm -hmm. um, in your discipline, in science in general, mm -hmm. and um, what does collaboration look like to you? To me, collaboration is just broadening the scope of my work, broadening the horizons, and um, it's something that I really enjoy about Davis. It's the most collaborative place that I've been in my career, and perhaps that's just how science is evolving everywhere, and I just happen to be noticing it because <laughs> I'm here. Um, um, as a grad student and postdoc, um, I was in labs where we, we had a large group and we were just kind of involved in our own studies. Um, I know, for example, that they're very collaborative as well, but um, as a graduate student working on my thesis project, I was kind of keyed in on whatever questions we were attempting to answer um, in, in the studies that we were doing together. But here at Davis, um, the, what really caught my attention is how m much people are involved in work with other laboratories. And it's um, just, I, I kind of think it's a different way to parallel process problems. And you have different viewpoints coming in, adding to perspectives that really, I think, allow us to keep our eye on the prize. You know, what's the, what's the overall goal, as well as, um, arrive to solutions more quickly because there's more brains <laughs> you know yeah. looking at the problem so yeah. kind of like the you know evolution of society as a whole that it the, the you know the major centers occurred where you had crossroads with trade routes coming in and through the cities and all of this information coming into a city really helped create a flowering of new ideas and and science and collaborative science is, is that same way you have you know, uh, trade routes, different viewpoints, different methods, techniques coming together to really um, expand and increase the pace of discovery. Have you been in collaborations or collaborative arrangements where, um, you know, you mentioned earlier kind of you follow the data and you kind of change your direction based on what the data is telling you. Have you had times in your career where you know, maybe collaborative partners have sort of shifted your, that trajectory that you were kind of on or shifted that um, level of inquiry as your kind yeah, of? Yeah, yeah, definitely. So um, when I first came here, I got involved in work on uh, Fragile X premutation, and that's not something that I would have, I don't think I would have, you know, become aware of that if I hadn't been here. So the collaboration with people here at the Mine Institute really drew drew us into into that inquiry and um, I don't think that would have happened otherwise. So I have a final question for you um, and I'm interested in you know you, you sort of alluded to sort of how scientists and in, in collaboration sort of mirror society um, and I think you know I brought up at the beginning sort of my own maybe conceptions of what a scientist is um, or what a scientist looks like, you know, from a very early age. And I think that in society, a lot of people sort of form opinions and uh, I guess form opinions or ideas about what science is or, what sci or who scientists are without necessarily a, a very clear or close under or a realistic understanding of what is happening. And I'm wondering in your perspective, what, what is a scientist's role in society, if any? Um. Yeah, I, it's the, the uh, role for scientists in society is important. I'm, <laughs> I'm undoubtedly biased, <laughs> but it's not great enough. We're not, um, we're not seen by 
the average person out <coughs> in society and the way we're portrayed in the media and movies and TV is usually wrong. <laughs> um, a, a primary example that comes to mind is um, Lorenzo's Oil was a movie about a family facing you know, a difficult solution. And the way the scientists were portrayed, we were such ivory tower, you know, isolated, don't give a hoot about society. And one scene in particular really brought that home in that uh, the, the parents who are trying to solve this problem and trying to help their child they go to visit the NIH, and they go to the NIH cafeteria, which is this cathedral, and all the scientists are sitting there, and they're in their suits and jackets and ties, and they're eating lunch on China and drinking fine wines. And, you know, I went to grad school across the street from the NIH, and that's not what the cafeteria looked like, you know. There's people in jeans and T-shirts, you know, eating food as fast as they could so they could go back to the lab. And, but that portrayal of scientists as being so isolated and out of touch, um, it needs to be improved. And, how to do that? I mean, we need outreach, and that's something you hear a lot, but how can that actually be achieved in, in a way that, that scientists have time for? So I'm probably average, uh, an average scientist in that, you know, we're busy, we're trying to get our work done, You're, you have to gather data, write papers, write grants, keep things moving. But um, it's funded largely and almost exclusively by, fe you know, by federal tax dollars. So we, um, it's a privilege, and we should have to give something back in return for that. The problem is time. You know, mm -hmm. how do you get the time to do that? The time isn't set aside. It doesn't magically appear fr from anywhere. Um, the only thing that I like, the crazy idea I have is, you know, maybe there could be something like a science corps. You know, so we have Peace Corps, we have things like that 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 people can apply for and go have experiences. Maybe there could be a science corps. Maybe, you know somewhere between finishing your PhD and starting a lab or, you know, you have a sabbatical and instead of your sabbatical is going somewhere else, your sabbatical is engaging with society in, in some way, you know, having a six month stint in a high school, helping teach, you know, these are crazy ideas, um, but we need, to, we need to give back what we're getting, you know, we're, we're doing this work on the public dime and we need to, to, to give back. Um, People could say, well, I am giving back. I'm providing understanding for disease processes. But, but the, you know, society needs to understand what we're doing to, to be invested in it, I think. And so we, we need solutions. You know, there are people working and thinking about it, but we need to, do, we need to keep moving and move more. Right. And so there's a big difference between a, you know, a, a peer-reviewed paper behind a paywall right. and, yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and a, and a scientists coming into a classroom for a, right. for a day and right. you know really inspiring kids or whatever so I think that's right. it's a very good point yeah um, yeah so we you know there are groups here in Davis um, we're involved in some of them that we go out and we do presentations to elementary students and it's always wonderful because no matter <laughs> where you go you know you could be in a school where kids children are poor and they have few resources they're just as bright and the questions they ask are just as salient, you know. They're just really wanting for resources and, and interaction with scientists. And, and that can be kind of helpful, you know. Absolutely. It's inspiring, right? I mean, you bring up these, this whole idea of how scientists are portrayed and it's the ivory tower. And all of a sudden, these mm -hmm. kind of somewhat larger than life figures are right in front of you and um, mm -hmm. teaching you this just awesome knowledge. and. It, it, it's humanizing, I think, in a lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's right. That's, that's yeah. a good way of putting it, humanizing. It's really needed. Definitely. Well, um, thank you so much for spending the time and talking with us today. Yeah, uh, we really fun. appreciate you uh, being here, and we really look forward to your Distinguished Lecture Series uh, coming up soon. All right, thank you. Thank I you. I really appreciate it. Thanks. The UC Davis Mind Institute was founded in 1998 with the promise to reduce and prevent the disabilities that can be associated with autism and other neurodevelopmental conditions. Every day, our clinicians and researchers make progress on that promise. Our groundbreaking research on autism, fragile X syndrome, chromosome 22Q11.2 deletion syndrome, ADHD, and other conditions associated with disability are helping affected individuals achieve their fullest potential. 
please visit our website or our social media platforms to find out more about current studies, upcoming events, and how you can help make a difference.